Amen. At this time, the children all the way up through age 12 uh, may be dismissed uh, to Children's Church. And would the rest of you please turn in your Bible to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, if you choose to use the seat Bibles we have available to you under the seats in the row in front of you, that would be page 440, Job chapter 1. Today we're going to spend most of our time simply in verse 1 of Job chapter 1. I hope all of you had a great time of giving thanks with your friends And family, this past Thursday, I'm certainly thankful for all of you and for the ministry that the Lord has entrusted to me, along with the elders and deacons here at Faith. And I'm anticipating great things uh, for our church in the coming year, and I hope that the same can be said of you. Um, And as you're turning there, I wanted to provide actually some clarifying remarks regarding something that I said last Sunday. Um, How many of you have heard of the Bereans? You heard of the Bereans? Many of you. That's good. That's good. Um, We read about them in Acts chapter 17, and the text tells us the Bereans were a noble people, and they were a people that were hungry for the word of God. Acts 17, 11 tells us that they received the word with eagerness, and I hope the same can be said about us here at Faith, and any time that the Bereans were taught the word, they would diligently examine the scriptures daily to see if what they were being taught was in fact true. And it encouraged me this week that we do have people like that here at Faith Bible Church. And what am I getting at as I say that? Um, Last week I mentioned the fact that Job was not perfect and that the events of the book occurred before the giving of the Mosaic law and the sacrificial system present in the tabernacle and the temple. And in support of this, I mentioned Job 1.5 and chapter 42, verses 7 and 8, and said that Job regularly offered sacrifices for himself and his family. And a careful Berean among us sent me a text message pointing out that those passages don't indicate that Job offered the sacrifices for himself, and she was right. Chapter 1, verse 5 refers to Job offering sacrifices specifically for his children, and chapter 42, verses 7 and 8 refers to Job offering a prayer for his friends who sacrificed at the Lord's command. So clearly these texts do speak of a time before the Levitical priesthood, as we said, but they do not refer to Job offering sacrifices for himself. Actually, a better text to support the fact that Job was not perfect would be uh, Job 19.25, where Job declares that his Redeemer lives. Only those obviously requiring redemption would need a Redeemer. And Job identifies himself as one of those who is in need of of redemption. So I misspoke and I apologize for that. And this provides a good opportunity for me to tell you that I, like Job, am not perfect. Um, but with all seriousness, though, I hope that you are all paying close attention anytime you receive teaching from God's word and are carefully testing what you hear against what the scriptures teach. We are to be people of the book, and our faith doesn't rest on our opinions or what I think or what you think God may or may not be like, but rather on who his word declares him to be. And one more thing, I know that I've said this before and I mean it. I'm always open to discussing any questions that you might have regarding the teaching and preaching of the word here at Faith, and I love and welcome those conversations. So please do not hesitate to come to me personally um, if you are ever in a place of confusion or even disagreement or simply want to talk further about something that we're studying here as a church. Um, With our Bibles open, uh, we will talk, grow together, and I trust be better for it. So with that said, let's shift our focus to where we're going today, and as we pause to do that, would you please pray with me? Father, we are all in need of your grace. We are weak people. We are frail people. We are faulty people. 
But God, we find joy in that your word tells us that you are putting us back together by the power of your spirit in view of the mercies that we have in the person and work of Jesus. And so, Lord, this morning as we come to your word, I pray that we would receive it for what it is, the very word of God, and that you would do the work that you intend to do in us, sanctifying us, carrying us along in that path of holiness to the praise of your glorious grace. Father, that you would be nourishing and encouraging us spiritually by the power of your word and through the person of your spirit. And that, Lord, you, as your word goes out this morning, would accomplish in our lives, in our minds, and in our hearts everything you've intended to do today. We know that you will because your word promises that very thing. And so, Father, we bow before you and ask that we would humbly receive your word today to the praise of your glorious grace. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this morning's message is Before Trials Come. Before Trials Come, this is the second message in a two-part series. If you were with us last week, we worked through Job chapters 1 and 2, noting that trials and suffering will be a part of our experience in a broken and sinful world. However, though trials should come, for the Christian, we can have joy. We can rest in God's goodness during the storm and when the waters of life are choppy. For we know that God desires to transform our lives by producing steadfastness, patience, and endurance in us, ultimately drawing us closer to Jesus through it all. And nothing we face in life is without a divinely ordained purpose that flows from the wisdom, love, and faithfulness of our merciful and gracious God. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, we know that all things, everybody say all things. things. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And last week we ended noting that trials prove, when we experience trials, they prove who we really are. And if you remember, we saw intensely different responses from Job and his wife to the trial and tragedy that Job experienced. Um, After losing his wealth, his servants, and his children, Job said the following in chapter 1, verses 20 and 22. The text says, Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And throughout all this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. And then after enduring excruciating physical suffering on top of all that he had already gone through, we encounter the reaction of both Job and his wife in Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The text says, His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. You speak as a foolish woman speaks, Job said to her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? Throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. And the question that we ended with as it relates to Job was how? If I were to endure, rather when I endure, deep, dark, dismal days of trial and suffering, how could I be a person? How could we be a people who, to the glory of God, would respond like Job, not cursing and despising the Lord, but worshiping, trusting, and resting in his divine providence? And so today, that's the question that we're going to consider. How can I live in such a way So I am prepared to respond as Job did and bring glory to God in my suffering. 
Let me say that one more time. How can I live, how can we live in such a way so to be prepared to respond as Job did and bring glory to God in my suffering? And to answer that question, we're heading to the very first verse of Job chapter 1, as I said, and we'll look more closely at three characteristics of Job's life, three things that were exemplified by Job before the trials came. And then we'll seek to become the same type of person by God's grace in view of Christ Jesus. And now, if you're here with us today, and you're right now going through a tough season in life, it doesn't mean that it's too late for you to start pursuing the characteristics that we'll talk about as we work through the message today. They should really be the aim of every follower of Jesus, and I trust that pressing into these things even amid your suffering will only serve to strengthen and bless you. So let's start here. Um, If you're taking notes, before trials come, before trials come, by God's grace, I will, number one, find my ultimate standing in the Lord. Before trials come, by God's grace, I will find my ultimate standing in the Lord. Look with me at verse 1 of Job chapter 1. God's word says, There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity. Many other translations, including the ESV, the NASB, and the NIV, use the adjectives blameless and upright. The fact of the matter is that Job's character was being refined through his relationship with God. And when I speak of Job's standing with the Lord, I'm referring to his relationship with God. Job had a right standing with God that resulted in the changing or the change of his character. That is, Job was blameless. He was upright. He was a person of complete integrity because of his relationship with God. The longtime pastor of Wheaton College Church, Kent Hughes, once wrote, integrity characterizes the entire person, not just part of him. He is righteous and honest through and through. He is not only that inside, but also in outer action. The Oxford Dictionary actually defines integrity as being whole or undivided. Job's heart and life were wholly devoted to the Lord. He was an undivided man prior to his suffering. Job's integrity flowed from his standing with the Lord. And maybe you have a similar testimony. And particularly if you came to know the Lord later in life, you look at your life before Christ, the things you valued, the choices you made, the company you kept, compromise was commonplace. Likely there wasn't much integrity. You didn't care about being faithful, honest, pure, or blameless. Perhaps you would easily give in to the influences around you, and it didn't bother you much to bend the truth to benefit yourself or even take advantage of others for personal gain and pleasure. But then you were graced with a new mind and heart from the Lord, You were granted repentance, as 2 Timothy 2.25 says, and everything changed. Like Zacchaeus in Luke 19, Jesus came after you. He invited himself into your house, and as a result, you desired to be different. In view of the grace of God and the free forgiveness of all your sin, you wanted in worshipful response to be a person of integrity, a person who lives for God's glory, undivided and wholly devoted to him. Job became a man of complete integrity as a result of his standing with the Lord, a standing that was established by God and carried along by God's grace. And when we speak of our standing with God or having a right relationship with God, we need to be clear about how a right or proper relationship with God is established and what the result will be according to Scripture because the truth is, we've stated this before, everyone has a relationship with God. Everyone has 
a relationship with God. There is not a person in this room or on this globe who does not have a relationship with God. Or perhaps to say it another way, the question isn't, do you have a relationship with God? But rather, what kind of relationship do you have with God? God's word places every person in one of two categories. You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. Adam, the first man, served as the federal head or the representative of the entire human race. And this might not sit well or resonate well with a 21st century Western culture that is thoroughly individualistic. But that is the design of God, displayed in Scripture as it relates to the human race. And when Adam chose to rebel against God's good word and God's kingly rule, he became a transgressor. He experienced the curse of sin, and he was sentenced to physical and spiritual death. We read this in Genesis chapter 2 when the text says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. In that command, God is establishing his benevolent goodness toward Adam. You're free to eat of any tree in the garden, but he's also establishing his kingly rule over Adam in the prohibition of eating from only one tree in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course we know that the man and his wife chose to be gods unto themselves and do what they desired instead of submitting to the declaration of the Lord and becoming sinners, they were cursed by God and sentenced to death. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 22 says, And he said to the man, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust." Because Adam was the first man and represented all his posterity or all those who would come after him, the human race fell and became enslaved to sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 tell us that death came through a man, namely Adam, and in Adam all, everybody say all, all all die. Every person born into this world is in Adam, guilty and dead in their sins and trespasses and justly under the wrath of God, according to Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. But there is good news. The gospel of God's grace or undeserved favor in Christ Jesus. A way, in fact, only one way or the way to be put in a right relationship with God, is available to all who would believe in the last man or the second man, Jesus Christ. Romans 5.17 says, If by the one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So the question is, are you, still guilty of sin and under God's righteous wrath? Or have you been reconciled and redeemed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have you received the gift of righteousness by believing in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins, freedom from condemnation, and a future of life everlasting with him? The gift of righteousness that Romans 5.17 speaks of is called justification. Justification. What is justification? What does it mean to be justified in God's sight? It, It looks like this. 
The righteousness that you and I require to be in a right relationship with God cannot be produced by us. No amount of good deeds will take away the guilt of our sin. We need the guilt to be taken away. We need our debt of sin to be canceled. And we need a perfect record of obedience reckoned or gifted to us. And the Bible says, in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus, the great exchange of our guilt for the grace of his righteousness is available to all who believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Verses 20 and 21 says, We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Justification is the legal declaration of my guilt, of your guilt if you are in Christ, being pardoned and my sin being forgiven because Jesus stood in my place on the cross as one condemned for my sin. Then he gifted me by grace through faith his perfect record of obedience as my own. It's not that I am righteous, by my own actions and effort, but a righteousness from outside myself, the very righteousness of Christ, has been given to me by grace. It's it's just as if I have never sinned and just as if I have always obeyed. Justification secures my standing with the Lord. If you are in Christ, justification secures your standing with the Lord. Beyond that, Those who are justified by grace are also being sanctified by grace. Sanctification refers to being set apart as holy and being changed into the likeness of Jesus by walking in obedience to God's word and in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, sanctification is the outcome of a secure standing with the Lord. It is by God's sanctifying work in my life through the power of His Spirit that I will become a person like Job of integrity. As sin is worked out of me and holy living becomes my desire, we will grow to be people who walk uprightly in response to the grace that we've received in Christ. And all of that to say, are you finding your ultimate standing in the Lord? What is the nature of your relationship with God? Are you still in Adam, guilty, under, and worthy of God's righteous wrath? Or have you turned from your sin and received the gift of life, forgiveness, and freedom from sin that is available to you in Jesus Christ? I would say to you today, turn to Christ, believe in him, bow to him as Lord and Savior, and find your ultimate standing in the Lord. And I would challenge you, to not leave this place today until you know squarely where you stand with God. Please come talk to me or those who will be available after the service to pray with you if you have any questions about what it means to submit your life to Jesus in believing obedience. And while submitting your life to Christ and finding your ultimate standing in him doesn't guarantee you a life free from suffering, it does mean that he will be with you, that he will be in you, that he will be for you amid your suffering, and that when he finally returns to finally and fully crush Satan, sin, and death, Our momentary light affliction will give way to an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory in his presence, free from suffering and sin forever and ever. That brings us to our second point this morning. You can mark this down. Before trials come, before trials come by God's grace, I will place my ultimate security in the Lord. 
Before trials come, by God's grace, I will place my ultimate security in the Lord. Look again with me at Job 1.1 as we read a bit further in that verse. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity. And then the text says, who feared God. Who feared God. What does it mean that Job feared God? And and what were the results in Job's life because he feared the Lord? As we seek to answer that, I want to first consider the concept of fear in general. Um, First, as it relates to that, some definitions. Um, As a noun, the Oxford Dictionary defines fear this way. Um, It's an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain. Or a threat. As a verb, it's defined as being afraid of someone or something as likely to be dangerous, painful, or threatening. Peer, fear, pardon me, can be caused by many things and take on many forms. Most psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors of the mind, what have you, agree that there are generally five forms of fear. Five forms of fear. Number one, there's the fear of abandonment. What if they leave me? Number two, there's the fear of the loss of identity. Who am I? I don't really know. Three, there's the fear of the loss of meaning. What am I doing? Number four, there's the fear of the loss of purpose. Why am I here? What's the point? And finally, number five, there's the fear of death or pain or sickness. What if I get sick? What if there's no cure? What if they find it too late? What if I suffer? What if I die? Now, it's so important to remember that the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. What do I mean by that? It's incredible, really, that all of those fears that I just mentioned, fears that when left unchecked and unanswered can drive a person to despair, all of those fears do find their ultimate answers and subsequent comfort in Christ. If everyone I love were to abandon me, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If I'm confused about who I am, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the verse tells me that in Christ, I am a new creation. I am loved, forgiven, righteous, and reconciled to God, and I am his beloved child. If I fear life is without meaning, according to 2 Corinthians 5.15, I am no longer to live for myself, but for him who died for me and was raised. And I am here now to know God and to bring glory to him as I enjoy his majesty and beauty. If I feel I have no purpose, according to Ephesians 2.10, as one who has been saved by God in Christ, I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. And what if I experience pain, suffering, or even death? Romans chapter 8 Verses 34 and 35, and also verses 37 and 39 say that Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus 
our Lord. Jesus is the answer to all of our earthly fears. So he can rightly say, as it relates to our fears, don't be afraid, only believe. In Matthew chapter 10, 28, though, Jesus did say that there is a type of fear that is proper and good, that being the fear of the Lord. We read it in Job 1.1 that Job feared God, but what really does that mean? And what were the results in Job's life because he feared the Lord? When Scripture speaks about fearing God, it often refers to having a proper reverence and awe before him because of who he is. It's like if you've ever visited the Grand Canyon, you have that like heavy and sobering feeling as you stand near the edge and sense the immense enormity of the chasm that's before you. Um, we just were on vacation, as many of you know, and, and uh, I'd never been to Pennsylvania before. And uh, like the mountains really aren't even there yet. But like we were driving, and all of a sudden we came around the end, like this bend, and it looked like literally on the side of the road it just dropped about I don't know a thousand or more feet, and then it was like this sprawling valley. And immediately in my gut, I got this like I don't want to be driving right now. I'm gonna get as far away from the guardrail as I possibly can. I'm gonna hug the shoulder on this side until we get through whatever is going on over there. And then they were like, like, is it really that bad? Because like we tried to take pictures of it. And like as you put your camera, maybe you know this, if you've been on vacation and you see something that's just incredible, and then for whatever reason, you hold your camera up and you're like, it just doesn't, it, so we're like, that, that's a huge drop off. And then Susan like held her camera up and we're like, it doesn't look so bad really at all. But I still felt like sick to my stomach as it was about a five minute journey on that, what seemed to be the cliffs of Pennsylvania but I was, I was sobered by that. I had a respect for the edge of the road because I didn't want to challenge it really in any way. When Scripture speaks of fearing God, it refers to having a proper reverence and awe before him because of who he is, like standing before the Grand Canyon, or being on a road where the side simply drops off. You care to not, you take care rather, to not get too close because you know what the consequences of carelessness or irresponsibility could be. We read in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Fearing God begins with knowing who he is and in light of him, understanding correctly who we are. Job chapter 28 verses 25 to 28 says, when God fixed the weight of the wind and distributed the water by measure, when he established a limit for the rain and a path for the lightning, he considered wisdom and evaluated it. He established it and examined it. He said to mankind, fear the Lord. That is wisdom, and to turn from evil is understanding. When I fear the Lord, it means I'm living in such a way that demonstrates a desire to maintain a right relationship with the fear source. So I joyfully and reverently do what he calls me to do, to rest in him, to rely upon him, to remain in him, to respond obediently to his word, to read, know, and trust his promises. This, then, is what it is to know true and lasting security. The one who has the power to speak the universe into existence and uphold it by the word of his power holds on to you with his covenantal love if you are in Christ Jesus. Oswald Chambers once said, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. It's the Lord who is in control. It's the Lord who provides me with what I need. 
It is the Lord who is my portion. It is the Lord. It is before the Lord, rather, and with the Lord that I live my life. If I have him, I have all I need, and I am secure. We experience, and Job experienced, a profound security in the Lord when we find him to be truly sufficient and powerful and wise, and we flee to him for salvation. Job had this view of the Lord and subsequent security in the Lord as a result of his proper fear of the Lord. This is demonstrated, as you may remember, by his words in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, when Job responds to the first wave of suffering. We read it earlier, but we'll read it again. Verses 20 and 21 say, Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For Job, one who feared God, the Lord himself was enough. The Lord was all that Job truly needed. Job came into this world with nothing and would take nothing with him on his way out. If he had the Lord, he would be secure no matter the storm that he faced. Before the storms and the trials come, by God's grace, I will place my ultimate security in the Lord. That brings us to our last point this morning. Before trials come, by God's grace, I will draw my ultimate strength from the Lord. Before trials come, by God's grace, I will draw my ultimate strength from the Lord. Again, look with me at Job 1.1 and we'll read the verse now in its entirety. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. Where do we find the strength to walk with integrity. Where do we find the strength truly to turn away from evil and live obediently both before and when the trials come? This certainly does not come from ourselves. Job knew that himself. He said in 28.3 that he would walk through the darkness by the Lord's light. If you would, keep your finger there in Job chapter 1 and flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, if you're using our Bibles, that's page 1039. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul similarly instructs us to rely upon the Lord. In Ephesians 6.10, he says, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. That is, let the Lord's strength be your strength. And of course, that sounds good, but is it, is it really possible How do we, like Job, walk through the darkest times of life by the Lord's light and find strength from the Lord to stand in the trial and the storm? Paul continues in Ephesians 6, after the verse that we just read, detailing for us what it looks like to be strengthened by the Lord and walk in his vast strength. Paul says in verses 11 and following, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, as Job knew, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of darkness, or I should say experienced. He was unaware of what we're aware of in the story. Against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and have prepared everything to take your stand. What is God's word saying? Pardon me, what God's word is saying is that everything we need to find our ultimate strength in the Lord is provided to us by the Lord. God gives his children the armor, the strength they need to resist the onslaught of the enemy. And he goes on in detail at what that looks like. In verse 14, the text says, Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist. Truth. Where do we find this truth that provides us with security and stability like a belt around our waist? Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. 
So in view of Christ, to be strong is to be a person whose mind and heart are saturated with Scripture. Yet we continue in Ephesians 6. Look at the next element of strong armor there. Righteousness, like armor on your chest. One pastor once said, the only weapon of lasting consequence that Satan truly has against us is the accusation of unforgiven sin, of guilt. If we are to be found guilty, then we are justly condemned before the judgment seat of God. But remember, a verse we mentioned earlier, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him, the one who did not know sin, Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you are in Christ, you have a righteousness that is not your own, but one that has been given to you by grace through faith in Christ. You are justified and you stand strongly secure in view of Jesus. The text continues there. And your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. We are people who bring the message of freedom and forgiveness in Christ to those around us and flee ourselves again and again to the good and saving news of the gospel of what God has done to save sinners like us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then look there at what Paul says next in verse 16. In every situation... Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Scripture refers to Satan as the accuser of God's people in Revelation 12.10. And whether our storm takes the form of an onslaught of accusations from the enemy leading to an overwhelming sense of doubt about our standing with the Lord or his goodness, or perhaps it comes in the form of heavy anxiety, The strength to endure is given to us by the Lord in the form of the shield of faith. Faith, of course, as it's been helpfully defined, is believing God's word and acting upon it no matter how I feel because when I do, God promises a good result. Face the storms and trials of your doubts, fears, and anxieties with the sturdy and reliable truth of God's word. Believe his promises no matter how you feel and allow your feelings to be formed by your faith in his word. Paul finishes here by noting our salvation in the place of the word and prayer in the life of the believer. Look at verses 17 and 18. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the spirit. And with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Perhaps to sum it all up, we draw our ultimate strength from the Lord as we live with an utter reliance upon all that he has provided for us. His word, by faith in his precious promises, which are ours in Christ, and through his spirit who lives in those who are in Christ Jesus. But in order to rely upon his word, we must be a people who know his word. And to walk by the power of the spirit, we must submit to and keep in step with the spirit as we obediently follow God's commands. But how gracious God has been to give us everything we need to be strengthened before and during the storms of life. And as we close this morning, I would like to invite the band to come up. This has been quite a bit to take in, I think, this week and last week. But I hope it's been helpful in preparing us for the trials and suffering we face, knowing That there is an all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God who providentially reigns over every trial that we face. And that we can be those who, before the trials come, like Job, are seeking to be people who, by God's grace, are standing in the Lord, resting secure in Him, 
and living according to the strength that he provides. In this world, Jesus said, you will have suffering. But take heart. Jesus has conquered the world. May he be all our comfort and peace and strength as we endure and persevere to the praise of God's glorious grace until Christ returns or calls us home. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It is a rock upon which we can stand. May we, by your grace, and as your spirit gives us both the desire and the wisdom, build our lives upon it. So even as the waves crash upon us, the foundation upon which we stand would be so firm that we would not be shaken, but that we would cling ever more closely to Jesus as we see him, as we know him, as we follow him through your word. Do that in us for your glory, for our good, and for the strength that we so desperately need from your hand to face the trials of life. We pray that in Jesus' name.